Good morning. Good morning. Today is the 17th Sunday after the Festival of Pentecost. The theme for the readings this morning is suffering. In the Gospel lesson, Jesus tells his disciples, and that includes us, that we will have to take up a cross, suffering, if we are going to follow him. In the Old Testament lesson, which will serve as the sermon text, Jeremiah suffered because he proclaimed the word of the Lord truthfully. And in the epistle lesson from 1 Peter chapter 4, Peter tells us how we can act when we are being persecuted. The common theme of suffering. Since we are celebrating the Lord's Supper this morning, we will begin with our confessional hymn, hymn 306. We'll begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins to God our Father, asking Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Father has been merciful to us and has given his only son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. be with you. Let us pray. Lord, we pray that your mercy and grace may always go before and follow after us, that loving you with undivided hearts, we may be ready for every good and useful work. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The first lesson this morning is the Old Testament lesson. It is recorded in the book of Jeremiah. We we'll read from chapter 38. These words are also the sermon text for this morning. Shephatiah, son of Matan, Gedaliah, son of Pasher, Jehuchel, son of Shelemiah, and Pasher, son of Melchijah, heard what Jeremiah was telling all the people when he said, This is what the Lord says. Whoever stays in the city will die by the sword, famine, or plague, but whoever goes over to the Babylonians will live. He will escape with his life. He will live. And this is what the Lord says. This city will certainly be handed over to the army of the king of Babylon, who will capture it. Then the officials said to the king, This man should be put to death. He is discouraging the soldiers who are left in the city, as well as all the people, by the things he is saying to them. This man is not seeking the good of these people, but their ruin. He is in your hands, King Zedekiah answered. The king can do nothing to oppose you. So they took Jeremiah and put him into the cistern of Melchijah, the king's son, which was in the courtyard of the guard. They lowered Jeremiah by ropes into the cistern. It had no water in it, only mud. And Jeremiah sank down into the mud. But Ebed Melech, a Cushite, an official in the royal palace, heard that they had put Jeremiah into the cistern. While the king was sitting in the Benjamin gate, Ebed Melech went out of the palace and said to him, My lord, the king, these men have acted wickedly in all they have done to Jeremiah, the prophet. They have thrown him into a cistern where he will starve to death when there is no longer any bread in the city. Then the king commanded Ebed Malk the Cushite, Take thirty men from here with you and lift Jeremiah, the prophet, out of the cistern before he dies. So Ebed Malk took the men with him and went to a room under the treasury in the palace. He took some old rags and worn out clothes from there and let them down with ropes to Jeremiah in the cistern. Ebed Melech, the Cushite, said to Jeremiah, Put these old rags and worn out clothes under your arms to pad the ropes. Jeremiah did so. And they pulled him up with the ropes and lifted him out of the cistern. And Jeremiah remained in the courtyard of the guard. 
the word of the Lord. The psalm for this 17th Sunday after Pentecost is Psalm 116. It is on page 107. If you are following in the hymnal, we will sing in unison. second lesson this morning is the epistle lesson we read this morning from first peter chapter four dear friends do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you but rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed if you are insulted because of the name of christ you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of god rests on you if you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed. But praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. The word of the Lord. Alleluia. Everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of scriptures, we might have hope. Alleluia. Please rise for the gospel lesson. The gospel lesson for the 17th Sunday after Pentecost is recorded in Mark's gospel, chapter 8. We'll begin reading at verse 27. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? 
Peter answered, You are the Christ. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. We'll now make a confession of our Christian faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We'll continue with him. I think it's 442. You may be seated.
Grace and peace to you from God the Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In the name of Jesus, dear friends, Daniel. Do you remember Daniel from Sunday school? Daniel remained faithful to the true God and did not bow down to the king. And as a result, you remember what happened. He was thrown into a den of hungry lions. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Do you remember those names? Those are the three men that were thrown into a fiery furnace, a furnace so hot that it killed the people who threw them into the furnace because they refused to worship the king and remained faithful to the true God. But we know the results of both of those stories, don't we? The Lord closed the lion's mouths so that Daniel was not eaten. And through the Lord's protecting hand, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not touched by the fire and they did not even smell like fire. Those two Bible stories, along with this story from Jeremiah's life, lead us to the conclusion that faithfulness to the Lord can lead to frightening consequences. As we study this brief excerpt from Jeremiah's life, we will see that Jeremiah was left for dead. But in the end, through the Lord's protecting hand, Jeremiah was lifted to safety. The story begins, Shephatiah, son of Matan, Genaliah, son of Pashur, Jehuchal, son of Shalemiah, and Pashur, son of Malchijah, heard what Jeremiah was telling all the people when he said, this is what the Lord says. Whoever stays in this city will die by the sword, famine, or plague. But whoever goes over to the Babylonians will live. He will escape with his life. He will live. And this is what the Lord says. This city will certainly be handed over to the army of the king of Babylon, who will capture it. Then the officials said to the king, This man should be put to death. He is discouraging the soldiers who are left in this city, as well as all the people, by the things he is saying to them. This man is not seeking the good of these people, but their ruin. He is in your hands, King Zedekiah answered. The king can do nothing to oppose you. So they took Jeremiah and put him into the cistern of Malchijah, the king's son, which was in the courtyard of the guard. They lowered Jeremiah by ropes into the cistern. It had no water in it, only mud. And Jeremiah sank down into the mud. At the time of our text, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon had laid siege to Jerusalem for one and a half years. The Lord's promise that it, Jerusalem would be destroyed was soon to be proven true. The end of Jerusalem was near. Seeing that the end was near and by the command of the Lord, Jeremiah told the people remaining in the city of Jerusalem to leave the city and to go over to the Babylonians. What Jeremiah was proposing was an unconditional surrender. By encouraging the people to do this, Jeremiah was offering the people of, of Jerusalem a chance at life. It would be the life of a captive, and that would not be an easy life, but at least it was life. Otherwise, the Lord predicted they would die by the sword, famine, and plague, all horrible ways to die if they remained in the city of Jerusalem. This was the word of the Lord, the God of grace and compassion, the Lord who does not want anyone to perish. The Lord wanted to spare his people from the triple threat of the sword, famine, and plague. The Lord wanted his people to live, and he was giving them one more chance at life. But Jeremiah's words, and ultimately the Lord's words, were quite unpopular with and under, misunderstood 
by the royal princes of Judah by the names of Shephatiah, Gedaliah, Pasher, and Shelemiah. They did not believe the words of the Lord which had come from Jeremiah. To them, Jeremiah's words were like treason. They were of the opinion that Jeremiah's words were demoralizing the people and the soldiers who were left in the city. These royal officials did not want to hear Jeremiah's words and they longed for Jeremiah's death. So these men approached the king, Zedekiah, to try and seal the fate of Jeremiah. Zedekiah was a puppet king who had been installed on the throne of Judah by King Nebuchadnezzar. Zedekiah was a weak-kneed and vacillating king, afraid of and easily swayed by his royal officials. And Zedekiah was also an unbeliever and an idolater, and he did not believe the Lord's words. These aforementioned royal officials demanded Jeremiah's life from Zedekiah. And when he was forced to give an answer about Jeremiah's life, King Zedekiah gave a cowardly response. He said, he is in your hands. The king can do nothing to oppose you. Because he was too frightened of his royal officials, he did not stand up for Jeremiah, but betrayed him to his enemies. The royal officials got what they desired. Jeremiah would die. To accomplish their wicked will, the royal officials lowered Jeremiah into a cistern located in the courtyard of the guard. It was so deep this cistern was that they had to lower Jeremiah into it by ropes. And the cistern was empty, except for a deep layer of mud and vermin into which Jeremiah sank. And there they left Jeremiah to die a miserable, lingering death in a dark, foul-smelling, vermin-infested pit. The royal officials had certainly not killed Jeremiah yet, but they had effectively silenced him, for he could not speak his lies from the pit, and no one could hear his lies in the pit. These unbelieving, intolerant men did all this to Jeremiah, simply because he spoke the word of the Lord truthfully. Was this the end of the Lord's faithful prophet Jeremiah? Was it his fate to die a horrible death in a dark and dungy, vermin-infested pit? Had the Lord forgotten about Jeremiah? No, the Lord had not forgotten about Jeremiah. He was well aware of his plight. And the Lord was certainly not going to let this pit be Jeremiah's tomb. The story continues, but ebed melech a Cushite, an official in a royal palace heard that they had put Jeremiah into the cistern. While the king was sitting in the Benjamin gate, Ebedmelech went out of the palace and said to him, My lord the king, these men have acted wickedly in all they have done to Jeremiah the prophet. They have thrown him into a cistern where he will starve to death when there is no longer any bread in the city. Then the king commanded Ebedmelech the Cushite, Take thirty men from here with you and lift Jeremiah the prophet out of the cistern before he dies. So Abed melech took the men with him and went to a room under the treasury in the palace. He took some old rags and worn out clothes from there and let them down with ropes to Jeremiah in the cistern. Abed melech the Cushite said to Jeremiah, put these old rags and worn out clothes under your arms to pad the ropes. Jeremiah did so. And they pulled him up with the ropes and lifted him out of the cistern and Jeremiah remained in the courtyard of the guard. In his grace and love, the Lord rescued his faithful prophet Jeremiah through a man named Abed melech That unusual name means servant of the king. Abed melech was a Cushite. He had come from Ethiopia with King Zedekiah to serve in his household. 
Ebed-Melech the Gentile, the Cushite, had heard the words of the Lord's faithful prophet Jeremiah many times in, the Lord, in, Je in Zedekiah's palace. Those words touched and changed Ebed-Melech's heart. He believed in the Lord, and he believed the Lord's words along with Ze Zechariah, Zedekiah's, Jeremiah's proclamation to leave the city. Ebed Melech was concerned about Jeremiah. He knew that Jeremiah had been mistreated by the royal officials, and he was certain that Jeremiah would die in the pit from starvation if someone did not intervene. And so, with a courage that put the kings to shame, Ebed Melech went to King Zedekiah at the Benjamin Gate, where he was holding court. And Abed Melech, in the presence of the king, stood up for Jeremiah by condemning the sinful actions the royal officials had taken against him. King Zedekiah was moved by Abed Melech's words. And seeing an opportunity to quell his guilty conscience, he told Abed Melech, he commanded Abed Melech to go and rescue Jeremiah from the pit and to take 30 men with him to ensure his success. And Abimelech quickly complied with the king's command. Jeremiah was so weak from hunger and thirst and all the abuse that he had suffered, there was no way he was going to get himself out of that pit. So Abimelech lowered down ropes and rags and worn out clothes and told Jeremiah to put them under his armpits so the ropes would not hurt him. And having done that, Abed Melech and the 30 men with him lifted Jeremiah from the pit and kept him in the courtyard of the guard until Jerusalem fell, safe and secure. The Lord had rescued his faithful prophet Jeremiah from the wrath of his enemies and from certain death because he had spoken the word truthfully through a faithful man with an unusual name. Solomon wrote, there is nothing new under the sun. How right he was. What happened to Jeremiah still happens to believers today. We preach and we teach the Lord's word truthfully. We preach and teach that Jesus is the only way to be saved. That homosexuality is a sin. That same-sex marriages are an abomination. That abortion is murder. But there are many people in our world who do not want to hear such things. And their intolerance of our message leads them to lie about us. And in their blind unbelief, they try to silence us by leveling false accusations against us. They label us in our message as divisive, homophobic, discriminatory, radical, inflammatory. And their opposition grows more heated and more vitriolic day by day. We and our fellow believers have felt persecution just like the apostles and the prophets and the believers before us. And perhaps that persecution will get worse as we look at the social, political, and religious climate of our land. Yet in these times of persecution, when we are persecuted for being faithful to the Lord, and proclaiming his word faithfully, we can be absolutely certain that the Lord has not forgotten about us and he will not forget about us as he did not forget about Jeremiah. We can be certain that he will protect and defend us from the hands and the actions of those who desire to hurt us. And we know that if our persecution should end in our death, eternal life awaits us. During times of persecution, we will do as Peter encouraged in the epistle lesson. We will commit ourselves to our faithful creator and continue to do good. 
We will place ourselves and our lives in the hands of our faithful and our almighty creator, and we will continue to proclaim his word without apology, boldly, confidently, and faithfully, in spite of any danger or threat. Yet in spite of all those assurances, too often we keep our mouths shut or tone down our message instead of speaking boldly and courageously. We do these things because we do not want to look stupid or feel the abuse of those with whom we associate or the abuse of those who are sinning and who need correction. Because of our silence, our fear, our cowardice, precious souls are not hearing the words they need to hear to be brought to repentance and to faith in Jesus. I know that I have so many times kept my mouth shut when I should have spoken boldly. How about you? Do we not all deserve God's punishment? But God will not punish us for the sake of his son, our savior, Jesus. He boldly and courageously preached and taught the word and the will of his father until it cost him his life by crucifixion on a Roman cross. Yet that death has abolished our sins and expunge them from our record. And three days after he died, Jesus rose again, making our forgiveness incontrovertible and undeniable. When you receive the bread and the wine along with Jesus' body and blood in the sacrament later on, you can be assured personally that Jesus' death has taken away your sins. And that when you close your eyes in death, you immediately see the gates of heaven open for you. May God give us all the strength of his faithful prophet Jeremiah and the courage of that faithful Cushite Ebed Melech as we strive to proclaim his word. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding will guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.
We will continue with the prayer of, church, prayer of the church, which begins on page number eight. Gracious God and Father, we praise you for the countless blessings which we receive from your hand, the beauties of creation and the bounties of the earth, the joy of life and the pleasure of friendship, the good of work and the gift of rest, the privilege to share happiness and sorrow with one another. Above all, we praise and thank you for your saving word and for your son's body and blood, which you give us to eat and to drink in the sacrament. Through these means of grace, you send the Holy Spirit into our hearts to unite us to Jesus and to the whole Christian church on earth. Strengthen us through this heavenly food, increase our trust in Christ and our love for one another. Great God and Lord, without your continuing help, we easily waver in our faith, lose courage, and grow careless in watchfulness. The times and days are perilous. Give us strength to face the evils of each day with fresh confidence. Open our lips to speak of your grace and move us to use the gifts that you give us to share your word of salvation with all people. Protect and prosper the family, the school, the government, and all good institutions that you have established for the benefit of society. Remember in mercy those who are sick and suffering and bring healing to troubled homes and lives. Move us to pray for those in need and to help with deeds of kindness. Lord, hear us as we now bring you our private petitions. Now, eternal God and Father, keep us in the saving faith, and so enable us to overcome all things through our Lord Jesus Christ, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We'll continue with the order of service for Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and right so to do. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them to shepherd his flock till he comes again in glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Holy, holy, holy Lord God of heavenly hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he, blessed is he, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
please rise and join me in singing the song of Simeon. Thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. O God the Father, source of all goodness, in your loving kindness you sent your Son to share our humanity. We thank you that through him you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. We also pray that you will not forsake us, but will rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit so that we willingly serve you day after day. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Receive now the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look with favor on you and give you peace. We'll conclude this morning by singing the fifth verse of hymn 233. Good morning once again to all of you. Thank you for being with us. Uh, just a couple of things. We do have Bible study on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. We are continuing our 19-minute Bible studies. You're all welcome to attend. Um, Sunday school began this morning. I think we had four students. Was that correct? If you know of anybody that could be here, please let them know. Our Wednesday Bible classes continue this Wednesday. Our Genesis class is at 10 o'clock. The ladies' evening Bible class begins at 7. Everyone is invited to those. The Women of Faith has its meeting this Tuesday. It begins at 7 o'clock. Um, those are all the announcements that I have. Anybody else have anything? If you could humor me for just a few more minutes of your time, I know it's 11 o'clock, but um, could we run through a little bit of morning praise? It's the... Order of service on page 45 in the front part of your hymnal. So if you could open your hymnal to page 45. I would like to use this service on a regular basis. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with it, but uh, we will go through this. Um, if you know the liturgy, and you want to sing along, that's fine. Um, Joyce will play the things, and then can you just play for me? Maybe just give me a note, and then I'll sing my responses by myself. It shouldn't take us too long. It's a very short service. Um, so we'll begin um, with the morning hymn. That's also hymn number 588 in, in the hymnal. So if you ever want to see the music, you can see it there too. So Joyce, could you just play that for us? 
praise you now. The night is over, active and watchful, standing now before you, singing we offer prayer and meditation. Thus we adore you. And so we, three verses of that. And then this, the responses begin. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. Hasten to save me, O God. O Lord, come quickly to help me. The Spirit of the Lord fills the world. Let us worship Him. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. The deep places of the earth are in his hand. The heights of the hills are also His. The sea is His, for He made it, and His hand formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Then that's followed by a psalm. And then one of the lessons, we will not read all three lessons. The lesson will just be the lesson that will be the sermon text, the verse of the day, and then we sing a hymn, and then the sermon. And then on page 48, there's the song, We Praise You, O God. I don't know if you're familiar with, um, this, was it the song of Simeon? The Te Deum and the old hymn, though. I don't know if you were ever sang that. This is just a redoing of that hymn. So, Joyce, if you could just play that. Okay. We praise you, O God, we acclaim you as Lord. All creation worships you, Father everlasting. To you, all angels, all the powers of heaven, cherubim and seraphim, sing in endless praise. Holy, 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 Lord God of heavenly hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. The glorious company of apostles praise you. The noble fellowship of prophets praise you. The white-robed army of martyrs praise you. Throughout the world, the Holy Church acclaims you. Father of majesty unbounded, your glorious true and only Son, and the Holy Spirit advocate and guide, you, Christ, are the King of glory, the eternal Son of the Father. When you became man to set us free, you humbled yourself to be born of a virgin. You overcame the sting of death, 
and open the kingdom of heaven to all believers. You sit at the right hand of God in the glory of the Father. We believe that you will come to be our judge. Come then, Lord, and help your people. Bought with the price of your own blood and bring us with your saints to glory everlasting. And then the offering follows and then we conclude with the end of the service. The Lord have mercy. In the morning, O Lord, I call to you. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And we pray the Lord's Prayer, the prayer of grace, and then we have the response. Let us praise the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Okay, so that wasn't so difficult. I, I heard a lot of you singing. Oh, once you sing it 10 times, it'll be just like second nature to you. Um, we'll go through it again, maybe next Sunday, and then I'll just put it in regular um, worship order. We'll use common service on communion Sundays, and then on non-communion Sundays, we'll use service of the word, and then also morning praise. So thank you for bearing with me for just a few minutes. That only took us 10 minutes, so I appreciate your time. I have nothing else for you. God bless your day.